So welcome everyone to um, another Friends from the Field webinar. Um, I'll just let you know if, if you are kind of a groupie and, and tend to um, show up for these events that after this week, um, we're just going to be having one webinar per month. So one for June, one for July, one for August, and I think maybe one for September. And then we'll kind of reevaluate going into the fall and winter if we're going to um, end up doing more again or how it all works out. But we really appreciated everyone logging on and being a part of this series for the past year. Um, and if, if you're new here, this series is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust. Um, I'm the outreach coordinator for Blue Hill Heritage Trust, um, and then Jake is my counterpart at Island Heritage Trust. Um, so it's been a super fun series, and there's also, we have a big archive of past webinar videos if you'd like to check that out on either of our websites. Um, so before I turn it over to Karen, I'll pass it to Jake for a little tech help. Thanks, Lander, and thank you guys for tuning in on this beautiful main afternoon. We're going to use two features for Zoom today. Uh, mostly we're going to use the chat feature, which is at the bottom center of your screen. Um, I think some of you are already utilizing it, but if you're not, you most certainly can. You can let us know where you're tuning in from and, um, and you know how you heard about the webinar. Maybe it's always good for us to know. Uh, the other feature we'll use is the raise your hand. So we'll save that for the end. Uh, we'll save questions for the end of the presentation. We'll let Karen kind of have her flow through the hour. And then at the last five to 10 minutes, uh, Glander and I will comb through the chat sec um, section and, and ask your questions on your behalf. Or you can raise your hand. There's a little symbol there with a hand that's just to the right, center right of the chat button. And you can actually ask Karen your question on your own with your audio. So with that, I think that's all the tech help we'll need for this webinar. And I'll hand it back over to Lander for our formal introduction. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, and I'll just quickly add, I, I normally, um, we, we normally invite people to introduce themselves in the chat box if you would like to. So feel free to, um, to share your name and where you're coming from and um, maybe a little bit why you're interested in this particular topic. Um, and then I, I think um, Karen is gonna be maybe asking for a little participation in the chat box with some of her questions as well. So get ready for those. Um, and I am so excited to be introducing Karen Johnson, who's a Maine Master Naturalist. Um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Karen. We're super excited to hear what you did during quarantine and how you made the most of it. Well, thank you, Lander, and thank you, Jake. It's, it's very nice to meet you. I mean, I feel like I know you. I've been spending the year with you. So um, thank you for, for all that you do as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining me today. I can't see who you are, so that's probably good. So I spent the year taking walks by myself, contemplating what I was looking at, and always coming away with more questions than answers. And I came to realize that there's a vast amount of content on the web that could be accessed from my chair while I sit here at home. And I also want to acknowledge that I am aware that it was a very difficult time for a lot of people I was in quarantine with my husband at our home, so I had a companion, you know, it was always good. And my sympathy goes out to those of you who lived alone or who could not see your families. And I also especially admire all of the parents with children who really had to change their lives this past year. My own two children had to do this. They both had to start working at home. My daughter, Valerie, lives in Vermont and her husband assumed most of the childcare responsibilities for their two sons, and then he could pivot his work hours, and she worked. My son lives in Searsport, and his wife took care of their little boy, and he worked, and I just can't imagine how difficult that was for all those people. So it's remarkable to me to see what they had to do, and I admire everyone who has made it through this year. And thank goodness for Zoom, so I was able to see my grandchildren throughout the year. That was great. And I think we've all learned to use Zoom really well. And I was a Maine Master Naturalist graduate of the Fields Pond class in 2017. And um, when I retired, I saw, I didn't know anything about being a Maine Master Naturalist, but I retired and I saw in the Ellsworth American a little note 
uh, main master naturalist program was seeking students. I was accepted into the program and it really changed my life. I mean, there's no looking back once you start looking at nature. I came to appreciate the complexities of the natural world and to admire all the people who study it intensely and who share their knowledge with those of us seeking to understand it. Then in 2019, I was able to help coordinate the Ellsworth Maine Master Naturalist class with two of my uh, co-students, Karen Zimmerman and Mary Ely, who had graduated with me in 2017. So we spent a great year in 2019 running the course in Ellsworth. The Maine Master Naturalist program has a website, it was founded in 2011, the first class graduated in Los in 2012. The program was begun around a kitchen table by Fred Chikaki, Chloe Chun, Susan Hayward, and Dorcas Miller. There's a YouTube video on the Maine Master Naturalist website where they, the four of them talk about why they started it and what their vision was. There's more information about the program there also. And there's the announcement that the next course is scheduled to begin in January of 2020 at the Wells Estuary and Reserve at Lawd Home Farm. And applications will become available for people to fill out on September 1st. No applications are being accepted at this time, but we are getting ready for the next class in 2022. When COVID hit in March, the Waterville class was in the middle of its course and they all pivoted and graduated. They did a remarkable job as well. These are some of the topics that you go through in the Maine Master Naturalist course, how to learn about all these things. It was um, wonderful. It's a rigorous year of studying and um, it's taught by Maine master naturalists and outside experts who all volunteer their time. The whole premise of being a Maine master naturalist is that you educate people, but you volunteer all of your expertise to the class. The course provides hands-on learning in the classroom and in the field. Students deepen their learning through extensive homework, including nature journaling, sketching, and field observation. So our class was almost over. We did have to cancel our graduation that was scheduled for March 14th, 2020. And that was canceled, but we had pretty much wrapped up the class. So we were lucky in that respect. The course uses mostly hands-on learning because the focus is on field natural history. The Forest Trees of Maine is one of the textbooks we use in the class. This book has a winter key and a summer key but you need to know some terminology to be able to use a key. And that's part of what the course does is teach you stuff. The, the a dichotomous key was very new to me, but we start using them and you keep using them and you learn everything you need to know by answering two questions at each step of the key. Like the winter key for forest trees of Maine, the leaves are evergreen or the leaves are deciduous. If the leaves are evergreen, you go to step two. If the leaves are deciduous, you go to step 10. So people, some people love keys. I can't say I love keys, but they're very useful. So we were doing our winter twig lesson. I'd never considered that winter twigs could be used to identify a tree. The specimen on the left was from my class. So here's my little twig I was looking at. Now I know I had never seen this twig before in my life. It has pussy willows, but it's not a, it's not a willow. It's an aspen in the genus Populus. On the right, there are two species of aspen. Can you see my cursor? Is it moving? Yes, thank you, I see. So um, this, this little, these little buds are shiny and brown. And these little buds are gray and fuzzy. So that's the first thing you learn to identify. Populus tremuloides, quaking aspen. When it buds out, it has shiny buds. The little pussy willows come out. Big tooth aspen, grandi dentata, the twigs are fuzzy and brown. So when I started studying aspen, 
I couldn't stop. I just love them. They're one of the first plants to flower in the spring. I just can't wait to see these little flowers blowing around in the breeze. The popular species are in the willow family. So some of the trees are male and some are female. So, you know, just trying to get around that idea of the monoecious and the dioecious is still really hard for me. So these that we're looking at here are the male catkins and they have the little pink anthers that are going to produce the pollen. And the pollen will be released in this blowing wind and find a female tree. And the female tree will get the pollen, get fertilized and produce the seeds. During the quarantine, I had a lot of time to watch the trees. The male catkins fall off first. After the pollen's released, these catkins just fall off. And the female catkins are pollinated. So this is these little red things here are the stigma where the pollen's going to go in and fertilize it. And then they hang on the tree and they develop. I just love them. So another activity, so you're watching the catkins, then the leaves will come out. The first leaves to emerge have beautiful colors. The quaking aspens are shiny and reddish brown. This is the quaking aspen, this one here. The oak leaves have a reddish hue. Little baby oak leaves, wonderful to see. And in the forest trees of Maine, they talk about the big tooth aspen leaves are distinctive silvery green. I just think of them as white and they're just like beautiful to see in the landscape. So these white leaves, you can see them here. Here's the little spot of the big tooth aspen in with um, the maples and the spruce and probably quaking aspen, but I just love to be able to spot these in the landscape. As we go through spring in Maine. So also as part of the Maine Master Naturalist program, each student completes a capstone project. My project was creating the Maine Master Naturalist Almanac. I started compiling all of the educational opportunities in the mid coast of Maine. I was stunned at how much education was going on that could help a person understand and appreciate the natural world. I found out about a lot of programs that were going on and when COVID hit, so I was keeping this calendar on my website just, you know, every day stuff was going on. When COVID hit, I figured that I would not have to do this calendar anymore. But I was wrong. In fact, you know, more educational opportunities cropped up. And I quickly realized I could go to events in Vermont or New York City or California. So my world just became, just expanded. The main Master Naturalist Almanac is a website and a Facebook page. The Google, Google Calendar is a public calendar. If you love calendars like I do, it's it's you can use it, you know, as you're on your own. So I did um, for the class. I went to all these different events and would give make re event reports, and those are on my website. So there was um, mammal tracks, snowflake workshop, the heron migration, sedges, aquatic insects. That was about how people who tie flies have to study mayflies, so they know how to tie their fly to get it to look like the mayfly that's emerging. Just um, stuff, you know, that is fascinating to me. Bogs and fens, intertidal zone, bird nests from pools, all kinds of things. One of the best instructors for a lot of these events that were held at the Blue Hill Public Library was Lynn Havsel. Her hands-on lessons are extremely informative. She gears them towards children, so that's good for me. You know, that's my level of learning, so that was good. So she had all kinds of things that she would show us and tools, and kids just loved it. So she was the first um, 
teacher that I learned to really admire. Um, tracking is one of the topics of the May Master Nationalist class. You um, learn the different sizes of tracks, how to analyze a track, and which animals make which kind of tracks. There's all kinds of information about it. And there are books for, you know, um, extreme experienced trackers. It's a vast topic. And it was important to me because after I learned about it, then I became very excited when it would snow and I would think, well, now it's, I can go out and see what's been across my field. How many mice are running around in my garden or under my car? How many of my neighborhood cats have walked across my property? What was the fox doing up in the field? Were the turkeys up in the field? Were the deer up in the field? Did the grouse come up today? So winter tracking really changed, you know, a big aspect of my life that in winter, you're just excited about the snow. And kind of like how many times did the mice go back and forth in this hole, which is up at the top. Another topic we do is vernal pools. And um, Lynn did a class in Blue Hill on vernal pools, joys of a winter evening, scooping stuff out, looking at the spermatophor of the spotted salamander and the wood frog eggs. And she had all this um, equipment for us to use to look at. We learned about the big night. We went to see the spring peepers and um, She's just a great teacher. And we learned all about the macro invertebrates grits that we could see. I had to learn how to dip into a vernal pool. I mean, this was not, this did not come naturally to me, collecting these specimens, but I learned. And then one of the first classes that happened was Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens um, had Matt Byrne who wrote a field guide to the animals of vernal pools. I think it's through um, Mass Audubon puts out the book, but it's a book we use in the Master Naturalist class. And so he gave a talk on Zoom at Coastal Maine Botanic Gardens. I think he was gonna be in person, but you know, you have to, I would have to drive there a couple hours to see it. So it was great. He gave a really great talk on um, the vernal pools. So that was my first exciting Zoom class. When um, working with Lynn, we're learning about the pool. So the little spring peeper tadpoles, the wood frog tadpoles, and the spotted salamander tadpoles living with their symbiotic green algae. That's what's in this slide. This year, for the first time, I was able to see the wood frogs at the vernal pool in Keels Pond Audubon Center. So this was like one of the highlights of my year, this year, seeing the wood frogs. When being master naturalists, we're supposed to educate the public. So we're supposed to give um, walks and stuff. So the last walk I went on was given by Sandra Mitchell, who is a cyber tracker. And she was taking us around Fields Pond to show us the evidence of winter critters and discuss how to analyze tracks in the snow. So I'm glad I went to this because that was the last time we really could get together outside with anyone. So I settled in to my uh, COVID year after that, after March uh, 14th when we canceled our class, I figured I wouldn't be keeping the events on the calendar. I subscribed to the New Yorker magazine because I was gonna have time to read it from cover to cover. I got my Netflix shows all lined up. But then on April 2nd, the Bucksport Town Council had their first Zoom meeting. So I said, hmm, I wonder what that's about, Zoom meeting, and then I could go to council meetings. But then everyone else was having Zoom meetings. So this wonderful time started for us. I could go to Vermont and all the other places that was having meetings. The Vermont Coverts, Vermont had, had a lot of the programs as well. And since I go to Burlington to see my daughter, and since the landscape over there is different and the plants are different, it was really wonderful to be able to 
zoom in to all of the things that they were doing. So one of the first classes they did was tree ID on April 2nd. And then you guys came along and Landra and Jake became two of my new best friends. Every Thursday, there they were. Wonderful to see their faces, really, you don't know, and hear about you know what, who they had us presenting. So Carol Leonard was your first one to premiere on April 30th. She was in our Ellsworth class and she had spent her year perched on a rock, observing nature, did wonderful journey, journal, journal entering, and gave a great talk about what she did. I was in awe of her, the whole thing. It was great. Um, and then of course you record these and put them up. So if people have missed this, they, if they haven't heard of Carol, then they can go back and watch the, the um, recordings and get their, and have their own inspiration. So you guys did um, a lot of people who were Maine Master Naturalists. Paul Powers presented about turtles. Cheryl Laz presented about the stone walls of Maine. Grace Bartlett talked about how, what she was doing during COVID on her Facebook page. Sandra Mitchell, who is a great tracker, but she did the secret lives of beavers. Karen Zimmerman did her nightlife presentation. Zoe Weil did her main wonders presentation. Donnie Senderson talked about spiders and Edwin Barkdahl did his pond life under the ice videos. Um, Edwin is also running a Facebook page, the Maine Naturalist Facebook page, where he still puts amazing videos. Um, his one today was a little caterpillar. Be sure you turn in, tune into that on Facebook. I use Facebook for education and to find out about events. It's like how I do it. The cicadas are emerging now. So the cicada Facebook pages are just wonderful to look at cicada mounds and what's going on with them. Then, um, Intensive education could also take place on Zoom. The North Branch Nature Center in Montpelier, Vermont presented a class on moss. And I had been studying moss, you know, on and off because there it is in our woods. You just want to know about it. And Jerry Jenkins, um, who, I don't know if he started, but he really works hard at the Northern Forest Atlas which is a great website and source of materials. So he, he had taught a class on moss at Eagle Hill. So then he was doing another field botany moss class through the North Branch Nature Center. So I tuned into that. And he used Google Groups to teach this. So this was like a new experience um, to use Google Groups. The students, we could all communicate with, with each other in the Google Group. I found it very useful and of course, the students, you know, were a lot of them were also experts and, you know, who knew a lot of stuff. So it was a great way to learn. And um, I really liked that and admired that he was like one of the first ones to try that. And then his, the Northern Forest Atlas website, he has posted all of these Moss class lessons for free. The Nor Northern Forest Atlas Project, wonderful website, wonderful publications and tons of free information on there that um, anyone can look at and talk about. And then of course you had Ken and Marty Crowell give their webinar on mosses and liverworts, again, that can be viewed. And um, meet your neighbors, explore the mosses in our coastal forest. They gave a ton of references. That was a wonderful um, event. And so when I was taking the class with Jerry Jenkins, I was looking at more at the mosses on my lawns because I've been looking at the mosses in our forest here. And I realized, well, you know, when I took the time, there was like these vast mosses in my lawn. And this one is the Plagionium cuspidatum, the thyme moss, which, you know, these yellow spore capsules were just, you know, beautiful. 
and what was it? And so I figured it out, you know, it's a short-lived evergreen perennial. The spore capsule is beautiful. And that's all over my lawn. Then growing um, on my, in my rock paths and down by the railroad track that I can look at is um, a cush little cushion moss. This is about two centimeters tall, but it has these um, really unique capsules. In the comment, it's, always, it's almost always found with capsules since the male and female organs are clustered together in the same group. It has nodding capsules on long ceda. Again, some words, you know, ceda is the word you need to know for the moss uh, stem here on the capsule. But um, I just had a great time looking, looking at moss. I have a great time looking at anything. You might appreciate that already. Atrican undulatum is a very common moss of soil banks. This had been in my, in my woods. It grows in the woods a lot in the shade or in my garden. So it has these wavy leaves. They're pretty big. You can see the wavy leaves. They call it uh, wavy catherine is another name for it. But this is all over and you just can look at, take it a uh, hand lens. You can see the costa in the leaf and the waves and the distinct capsules that it has. Just another moss. And then we were, I was studying moss on a log. So this Anomadon attenuatus, poodle moss, stringy mat forming papillos moss with oval leaves. So big, big clump of moss on the log. And what's unique with it is that it really has different structures in its own leaves. It has these little branches that are club shaped with knob ends due to the new growth. And then some branches are skinny with tiny leaves. This isn't a dried up leaf, it's just has some skinny branches with tiny leaves. So um, a, just a fascinating moss to look at. I mentioned the forest habitat of Maine. Another thing we study in the naturalist class is the natural landscapes of Maine because Maine has uh, many natural landscapes because we're such a huge state. So we get this book, but there's also a great, book, great website that you can go to and just find out about it. So landscapes have keys. Who knew? The first question you look at is, are the trees over 10 feet tall and form only greater than 30% of the cover? Are the trees over 10 feet tall and have less than 30% of the cover? And then you go down to the next key, you're either upland or wetland. You're either wooded upland, wooded wetland, and you keep going. And this book is great because in the um, each page, like the spruce pine woodland, they give you the characteristic plants that you'll find there. And they'll talk about similar types and they'll talk about soils and the animals that will be there. It's a really wonderful book to have, or at least to look at the website to appreciate what we have in Maine, why our nature is wonderful and why everyone comes here to see it. So in COVID, I needed a social network. I started watching the show Community, one of my son's favorite shows. I you know, was amused by it, but never really got it. But in COVID, I started to watch it. I really missed the community, I needed one. So this provided me this, this show and it is a hysterical show. So I recommend it if you're still looking for a community because I'm not sure we can go back out yet, but it's a, it's a really good show. So my social network, I had, um, had my 50th high school reunion in October of 2019. We were all grateful we got to be together for our 50th anniversary. So I formed a little texting group with um, three of my best friends. One lives in San Francisco, one lives in Houston, one lives in Providence, and then me. So, you know, we just could share our worst thoughts and our best moments of the year. My friend in San Francisco got to share that awful day when she woke up and there was no sun and the sky had turned orange and, you know, from the fires, it was terrible. My friend in Houston got to share the deep freeze, you know, all her landscape around her home just froze, pipes froze. I mean, Houston 
is, is was suffering. They're getting a lot of rain now. And my friend in Providence got to watch uh, Gina Raimondo give her um, nice COVID talks, you know, keep Rhode Island going through COVID. I might have watched Andrew Cuomo a bit in COVID, you know, in the beginning. We were all, you know, trying to do something to get us through. Um, and then I joined the last Wednesday tea of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Um, Rhode Island does not have a main master naturalist program. So I was just exploring like, why don't they, what are they? Well, they have this Rhode Island Natural History Survey and they had an announcement that they would be holding last Wednesday tea at 4 p.m. remotely on Zoom. So at this point, this was May 27th. I was, I, I would Zoom anyone who wanted to. So um, I zoomed in and they had all, you know, been dismissed from work and they're all at home. They want to get together. I asked if I could join the Zoom. They said, sure. Um, so I started that. And this was just really one of the um, wonderful things, meeting these people who are all very nice. And um, I would learn things like I was stunned to learn that kudzu had been found in Charleston, Rhode Island. I mean, this is awful, right? Yesterday, we Zoomed, because it was last Wednesday tea yesterday, and they were talking about going into the, to the forest and hear the frass dropping in the forest, the small little forest they have in Rhode Island. I'm from Rhode Island, you know, but I'll give them credit. So um, I think they're having a gypsy moth outbreak down there now. But this morning I was walking along the hatchery road at Craigbrook Fish Hatchery, and I could hear this, these little noises in the forest. So I'm just thinking it was frass dropping in the forest. So anyone out there who might know anything about going into our woodlands around here, the mid coast of Maine and hearing frass drop, drop, please post it. Also, please post in the chat what you did during COVID. I would love to hear about it. I'm gonna save the chat because I wanna know who was here. So thank you. So last Wednesday tea was a wonderful event and still is, I don't know, I don't know if they're gonna start having it in person or not, but anyway. And then um, book groups was another thing that um, helped. The Fields Pond Book Group is through the Penobscot um, branch of the Maine Audubon Society. It's been going on for years, but they have their meetings in Orono on Thursday evenings and I just was never able to go up there but they quickly pivoted and they decided on that their April 9th meeting would be on Zoom. They were discussing the formation of vegetable mold through the action of worms by Charles Darwin. This was a bestseller in 1881 when it came out. And if you haven't read books by Darwin, we all should. This was the first one I read. He's a wonderful writer, the, the topic is wonderful. He doesn't waste time with stuff. You just get right into what the earthworms are doing. And um, it was, it's a great book group and a lot of fun to see. This book, most of Darwin's books, I think are available on, on the internet for free. This one was, and I had happened to come across two earthworms back in 2018 who were in the exchange of their sperm between two of them. The eggs of both would be fertilized later in the stored exchange sperm and then deposited in that girdle of mucus holding them together. The mucus band will eventually slip off their platella to become a sort of cocoon within which the embryos develop. I don't really understand what this is, but you can see that something strange is going on and this is sex with earthworms. Just a fascinating thing I happened upon one day. And Darwin talked about it a bit, but mostly he was talking about the, what they do in the dirt. And, and he just had you know, a, great, a great book. I recommend it if you're interested in earthworms. Um, another book club that formed was Hog Island, de developed a turn the page book club. I think uh, Lindsay and Eva from Hog Island wanted to start the club. And they, the book Birds of Maine had just come out. 
So Barbara Vickery has been doing a lot of the um, promotion of the book because her husband, Peter, had started the book and he died before it could be finished. And um, so there's been a lot of really good um, promotional events about the book. So the Turn the Page Book Club was the first one. The beginning of the book has really excellent like history of birding in Maine. They um, mention Cordelia Stanwood from Bird's Acre and a lot of other people and just how birding developed. So this book is an atlas, the birds of Maine. It's like, what, when has a black-billed cuckoo been in Maine? And you can go into the book and look it up and they'll tell you all the sightings of that bird through the years. That's like what the use of it is. You know, it has, when did the scarlet tanagers first come to Maine? I mean, you can look at that. And then we did um, the book, The Home Place by Drew Lanham, which has gotten a lot of press. That was a very good book. He, he comes to the meetings, they arrange the meeting, he comes to the meeting. We did a uh, Nature's Exploring Sketchbook with Jean McKay. And we did um, a World on the Wing book meeting with Scott Weedensaw. Now people from all over the country would, were, would be at these meetings. And um, I think a lot of people were given the Turn the Page Book Club as a Christmas present. So maybe they weren't too interested in birds, maybe they were. So I'd go to the meetings, we'd be put into little breakout rooms and you could talk to people, you know, about the question you were supposed to answer. Or if you were like me, you would just say, well, you know, what have you been up to and what are you doing? And we would have a little social moment at the book club. But it was, um, it was just a wonderful event. And so Lindsay and Eva just did a great job of, with that book club. A lot of events occurred. Um, Martha Bell created her intertidal habitat and intertidal zone videos that you can watch at the Island Heritage Trust website. They're still available. Um, Bangor Public Library did um, got some people to speak. Greg Marley gave a talk there on mushrooms. Greg Marley, you know, is very famous in Maine. He's written a couple books. He, he does great workshops if ever you can get together with him. I went to one in 2016 at Ellsworth and it's just, you know, a vast amount of stuff about the mushrooms. Um, Maine Audubon started doing stuff. Paul Powers did um, his talk for other organizations like Downey's Coastal Conservancy. Um, Roberta Sharp did her talk about wildflowers for Friends of Sears Island. Paul and Roberta are both Maine master naturalists. Lyme Disease Awareness Month occurred in May of 2020. And there would be weekly seminars about Lyme disease awareness. It was all over the country. People, things were held at the Southeastern Center of Excellence for vector-borne diseases, Northeast region. I mean, this, this was really good to see, but the extent of ticks and tick diseases all over the country out to the specific Pacific Southwest. I um, got my permethrin after that, sprayed my clothes, and um, recommend that you do that um, I have had uh, one tick disease in a plasmosis, and uh, my husband had another one, babesiosis. So I do not take any tick bite lightly. The Humane Tick Lab is open. You can send your tick there to get it identified and to find out if it has diseases. It only costs $15. It's really simple. You just go to the Humane Tick Lab and explain what to do. And um, I really recommend if you have a tick that you uh, get that done so that you know what you're dealing with if you get sick. The other thing that was wonderful last year was the open garden in Blue Hill that Leslie Clapp would do at her place there like once a month. She did a lot last year. You know, things were still pretty sad in Maine, but she opened her garden and you went and it was just wonderful. And she did it about once a month. And I just want to acknowledge that that was um, really important to me and helped a lot that I got through COVID. 
then I would come across something like the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network down in North Carolina. So they were doing these things with their electron microscope. And um, it was just wonderful. My career was spent uh, looking in a microscope. I was a cytotechnologist. So I looked at pap smears every day. My friend was my microscope. We look at that. So, you know, if you want me to look at a microscope, I'm there. But this was just great. And th this was geared again through K-12 audiences so I could understand it. And I think one of the first ones I went to was Here Be Dragons. And they were talking about the dragonfly wings and just a lot of information about that. So um, that was just a great program to go to. Also in the Master Naturalist program, we studied geology. So I think last year, I don't, they had to be closed, the state of Maine, their offices, but they, the Maine geological facts and localities started sending out pretty much monthly reports on their, um, some of their localities. So they did one on the Carter Nature Preserve, came out in June of 2020. These are great PDFs. You just look at them and they have all kinds of information. If you haven't looked at these, they are really, really nice to look at and give you um, information about geology and glaciation in Maine. Here we are looking at glacial boulders, mostly erratics at the base of the stairs right here, leading down to the water. Erratics are boulders transported and deposited by glaciers that do not match the underlying bedrock. There are several granite boulders in this collection, which are probably derived from the Lucerne granite to the north of the site. Several boulders of Ellsworth schists were derived locally and therefore are not erratics. So another topic that you can study is geology. Huge amount of terms and rocks and information. Just fascinating. I did try a trivia night. I don't know if anyone else has been doing that, but Penobscot Marine, Marine Museum has interns that come in the summer to help them out. So they were doing this Zoom trivia night. Um, I've heard people talk about it. It's, it's way too fast for me. The topic they did was marine literature. So, you know, if, unless you had recently read Moby Dick, maybe you couldn't answer the question. It was very entertaining, but I, uh, I decided I'm too old for trivia. So I did not do any more trivial pursuit. I just um, enjoyed that one night. But what I did enjoy was the Native Plant Trust um, did herbarium visits. So they did many different herb herbariums. I went to this one at Harvard, the Harvard Herbarium. You cannot go in, you get to the door. It says, hi, you know, call us up. We'll, we might help you. So <laughs> the woman acknowledged that. You just can't go in there because they have valuable stuff at any time, really. But the woman talked about five of the things they have. And one of them is the mummy's lichen. The mummy lichen of the feral herbarium is approximately 2,500 years old. It was found on a female Egyptian mummy from Thebes during the unwrapping process by the Montreal Natural History Society in 1859. The lichen was purposely placed on the mummy's chest as part of the preservation process prior to burial. The society sent a piece of the lichen to Edward, Edward Tuckerman, a renowned lichenologist at the time for identification. The lichen specimen came to the Farlam herbarium when Tuckerman's collection was purchased upon Mr. Tuckerman's death in 1886. And so the um, Farlow Herbarium is now part of the herbarium at Harvard. So just learned all about the herbarium. I'm just checking my time, thanks. The herbarium stuff that they have, why they're useful and what they do. Herbariums are another topic you can pursue. Then the New York Botanical Garden was having talks. I was just looking at their website last night. It's vast, all the stuff they had. I decided I wanted to go to Brazil. So I attended this talk where they're studying plant diversity in Brazil, sedge evolution in the, Atlant of the, in the Atlantic forest. So they're talking about this, these sedges in the Ricanospora 
genus with these inflorescences. And this one here is Capitolata, a brownish beak sedge that we do have in Maine. And also the white beak sedge that we have in Maine, the Reconospora alba, they mentioned that in the, in the slide. But it was all about history and evolution and um, that track way over my head, but you know, I would have to do a stretch every so often. And the New York Botanic Garden helped me with that. Also the Magnolia Society International. I had been to one of their meetings that they held in um, San Francisco because my best friend lives in San Francisco. So they held their first virtual meeting and they had um, really wonderful talks about all the um, magnolia introductions and development of the different species in Britain, you know, huge vast thing that they do there. And they also went to um, Columbia and talked about the native um, magnolias there, but how they're being, you know, they're all in danger, conservation in Colombia and South America. And um, they talked about that. It was a very good meeting. And then um, another class, um, I hope you've all heard of Charlie Eisman, who does his um, signs and tracks of insects in the leaves and studies the um, larvae that go through the leaves. He gives great talks. He, he teaches at Eagle Hill. And he did an online talk. Again, I think it was through the North Branch Nature Center. And he did it with, um, he would give a presentation we could watch on Zoom and then we could send, people could go out and collect pictures and send it to him. And then he would um, pull up the pictures and we could discuss them. So it was very interactive, live in time. It was a great example of how you could do uh, education. for people without, we, without any of us leaving our home. Um, and then maybe last fall, you guys got to, to notice the quaking aspen leaves with the little green islands. You know, the leaf is dead, but there's a little green island and Charlie had talked about that. Um, lots of these mines on the fallen leaves and he filled them up and he figured out what they were. Was it, introduced moth that was, you know, keeping the, this part of the leaf alive so it could feed. And uh, he talked all about that. He has a great blog, Charlie Eisman on um, bug tracks. The other topic I'm going to spare you is um, finding fertile fronds on the ferns. Maine doesn't have too many ferns. We study ferns in the Maine Master Naturalist class. And then, um, so fern phenology became something I was looking at. When do the fertile fronds develop? So this is a royal fern, fertile frond, full of the little spores. These are gonna be released and this turns brown and then that's what you see up at the top of the fern. So I'm going out to look for a white fluff um, to see if I can figure out which, which are the big tooth aspen and which are the quaking aspen fluff on the ground now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. That was wonderful. Are, are, are you all finished up? Yeah. Cool. Yes, I'm leaving. <laughs> oh no, that was that was fascinating. Oh my Very goodness, good. you did so many programs and webinars this past year. Your mind must just be so full of all of these things that you learned. It's so cool. You were so busy over quarantine. I, I just I'm so impressed. Yes. We had, a, we had a, a couple of people let you know what they were doing um, during quarantine. Um, I cooked a lot and played with my cat and went to bed really <laughs> early, so. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I left out my cooking uh, adventures. I, I tried to bake bread that, you know, was a disaster. So um, <laughs> it's bought bread, but yeah. 
So I don't know if we have any questions per se, but if anybody wanted to raise their hand and maybe just uh, give Karen a shout out or a comment or, or anything, or that would be more than welcomed. We have just about nine minutes or so to fill until five. So um, yeah, Karen, while we wait, is there anything more you wanted to say or any open discussion you wanted to crack open or? Um, it, well, it's just that, you know, learning continues the, um, so the firm phenology, um, I came across that idea uh, through the Jocelyn Botanical Society. I didn't mention that, but the Jocelyn Botanical Society is one of the oldest botanical societies in the country. Back in the olden days, people would get together like for a week in July and study plants somewhere in Maine. I think it started in 1878 and have been meeting annually ever since. I think they thought they had, had to cancel one meeting around World War I and I think around the 1918 flu. But other than that, they meet every, they get together every week. So last year they did cancel and did some Zoom presentations. But the Jocelyn Botanical Society is a professional society for botanists but they have let um, people like Maine Master Naturals who are really interested in botany um, join. Mm -hmm. That is like a great way to learn botany and be with the people in the field who just know every plant and you go through. So uh, one of the people I met there was trying to do fern phenology for, I think like nature's notebook. You know, you do nature's notebook, you're studying phenology and you wanna know, um, you know, what to look for. So she's trying to describe like, so that um, royal fern, how are you gonna describe that? What are you gonna say to people? You know, here's this green thing on the top, but you know, not every frond is gonna have it. So you have to look for it. And then when it turns brown is when the spores are released and then you would note that time. So she was just trying to go over how to make um, the fern taxonomy and the fern, um, words, you know, accessible to people for citizen science in the, um, in that. So then I started looking at ferns. So crozier's, um, Susan Hayward had done some stuff for crozier's. She was looking at crozier's, but then there's the crozier. Then when does the fertile frond appear? I started looking at that. So, you know, it, it's just, it's endless, your questions and what you want to find out and explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Karen. There, there are a couple of questions in the chat box if you would like to answer them. Um, what, the first one is, could you repeat the turn the page books that you read? Yes, we read, um, I think if I remember, The Birds of Maine, um, The Home Place by Drew Lanham. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I can go back here. Great. Um, There was um, a sketchbook thing and the um, migration one. Cool. Karen, there's, there's also a question in the chat box that kind of relates to this. Mm -hmm. um, wondering if we might send out people a follow-up email with a list of all the amazing resources that you shared. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might be able to supply me with that list and then I could send out the email. I've been jotting down um, some of the things, but I didn't capture all of them. I would be happy to compile the list, you know, cause that's what I do, compile lists, look at things. <laughs> so yeah, so Birds of Maine, The Home Place, The Nature Explorer's Sketchbook by Jean McKay mm -hmm. and Scott Wiedensall, um, a world on the wing hmm. and he yeah so i will make that list and um the list of the all the books in the club yeah uh, book clubs are great i'm in another book club the master G gardeners of hancock county have another book club and we end up reading a lot of nature things like a lot of baron heinrich books oh yeah and um and then the main master naturalist, I started a book club for them. We just read the Seaweed Chronicles by Susan Hand Shetterly. Yep. Oh yeah, and so I didn't mention the 
Blue Hill Library, their colloquies, the Down East colloquies. They did one on seaweeds. And um, Susan Hand Shetterly was at that and people who do seaweed art and people who are, are working on the seaweed, Hannah Weber did the class and the woman who, um, Robin Hadlock Seely, who worked on seaweed harvesting in Maine. Yeah, no, I just spend all my days <laughs> trying to say, okay, go outside now, because there's so much to learn and so many topics. <laughs> That's yeah. so cool, Karen. <laughs> do, you, do you have something coming up in the natural world that you're excited about observing with, with the seasons changing now from spring to summer? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I've got, I'll figure out the white fluff and the, that frass in the woods. No one answered that with the frass in the woods. That's my next thing. I have to consult all the foresters I know. You should consult all the foresters you know, please, and ask them if they cool. hear something falling in the woods. What do they know what it is or think it is? And um, yeah, so that's my next thing. What's cool. falling in the woods? That's and very then, neat. I'll ask our forester Sandy for you. See what I yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can't wait to find out. And this was at the on the fish hatchery road. So if someone wanted to walk along there tomorrow morning, they could hear it. Hmm. And then I'll have to walk in some more woods and see where else I might hear stuff. And it was like deciduous trees on one side and evergreens on the other side, but they both had things falling so it was um yeah very intriguing so you never know what's going to intrigue you <laughs> on any given day <laughs> yeah yeah i i commend your your leaps into research karen it must stem from your, your from your career and like just endless curiosity because sometimes yeah. Yeah. I have my own questions, but I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> one one explanation leads to another question, and then I often, you know, trail off or something. But you just really, it seems like you totally see it through, and I commend that so much. Yeah. Well, my career was great. I spent 39 years looking mostly at pap smears, but I was in the pathology lab. It's like every day I learned about some new human disease. Mm. I mean, it, it was just a fascinating thing. So now I don't have to learn about human diseases anymore, but the natural world is just as um, interesting with the animal diseases and tick diseases. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, which tick disease? <laughs> when are we gonna have a long star tick around and all that stuff? So yeah, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So thank you everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and your, for your time. Thank you so much, Karen. We really, really appreciate it. And you're um, very welcome. We're, yeah, I will send up a follow up email to everyone once I get your resources, and then people can explore some of the things you shared with us. Yes, and, I'll send the resources along. Thanks. Awesome. Hopefully, we'll see you out in the field someday. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> yes. Have we a good all hope for that. <laughs> Bye. Karen, I'll stay on for a second if you want to um, uh, download the chat. Is that yep. good? I'm doing it right now. Save the chat. Okay. Go in folder. Good. Okay. I've got it. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. Awesome, everybody. Have a great night. Okay. Bye. Bye.